All right, so we're gonna build a couple of props. First thing we're gonna do is build a chair. So oftentimes when you're modeling something in Maya, you wanna have some reference. And say, for example, if you wanna build a chair, you can just do a Google image search for a chair, find a picture of one that you like, and just save the image. And then you can bring it into Maya. Uh, you can actually map the, the image onto a polygon plane. So let's just create a plane by clicking on this button here. And we get a plane in the center. And we are messing around with our inputs later and they're still set to 10. So I'm just gonna change these to one because we don't need all that mesh on there. I'm just gonna scale this up. So let's look at it from the Z perspective. You can see at the bottom your coordinates here. So we're gonna look at it from the Z perspective. This is our stage. We're always gonna be looking at things in this direction. So because this is the rotate X, we're gonna, we want this to be straight up and down. So we're gonna change this to 90 degrees. The rotate X, we're just gonna type in 90 and enter that. So it's perfectly straight up and down. And I wanna get the image on here. So I'll just go through and show you how to do that. We'll go to window. So you'll learn a little bit about texturing by doing this. We'll go to rendering editors and just click on hypershade. We'll bring our hypershade up. And you should have a window that looks something like this. And you can see here our default shader is Lambert. The Lambert one shader is already on uh, any object that we create. So I don't wanna mess around with that default uh, shader. We're gonna create a new Lambert. So if you go down to the bottom here, you can scroll down and find Lambert. If you click on it, you'll get a new one. It'll be called Lambert 2. And let's just rename that. You can right click, go down to rename, and we'll just name it Chair Reference. And just hit okay or, or enter. We always wanna rename our shaders so that we know what shader belongs to what object. All right, so right now we've created a new shader here in the hypershade, but we haven't actually applied it to the polygon plane yet. We'll do that once we once we get the image on it. In this hypershade window, it gives us the attributes for that shader as well. Whichever shader we, we select, it gives us the attributes for that shader. All right, so make sure you have your chair reference shader selected, the Lambert. And we'll go over to the color attributes. There's all kinds of different attributes down here. We have transparency. You can make it transparent ambient color and all kinds of other things, but let's focus on the color attribute right now. I downloaded a, a JPEG of a chair and I'm just gonna link that JPEG to this to this Lambert. So to do that, we have to click on this little uh, checkerboard here at the end of the color slider. Once you do that, you'll have these render nodes that come up. So because it's a file, it's an image file, we're gonna be attaching a file to this Lambert. So I'll just click on file. And as soon as we do that, our attributes change here. We're now looking at the attributes for the file. It's just called file one by default. So go down to where it says image name and there's a, a yellow folder here. We wanna click on that to browse for the, the image that we downloaded. And I downloaded this earlier, it's called chair two model. And this is the chair we're gonna model. So just select the JPEG for that and hit open. And as soon as you do that, our chair reference now, the Lambert for our chair reference now has the, the image attached to it. Now we have to apply it to our polygon plane. And to do that, you can middle mouse button over it and just drag over the polygon plane and release. Or if you select the plane and right click over our new shader here, you can select the sign material to selection. Just two different ways to do that. So you probably still don't see it on there. We have to turn on textures in our viewport here. So I'm just gonna move this off screen. If we press four, this just shows us our wireframe. If we press five, it shows us the, the Lambert. If we press six, it shows us our textures. And seven shows the lighting, but we don't have any lights in the scene, so it's black. So pressing six just lets us see any textures in the scene. All right, so that's a little bit squashed. I'm just gonna go to my, my actual JPEG that I downloaded. And I just wanna make sure that it's not squashed like that. So we'll just hit R on our keyboard to scale this plane out a little bit. So we'll just scale out approximately to what it's supposed to look like. So something like that is fine. I chose this chair because it has some rigid parts to it, and it also has some more organic parts on these cushions. So that'll give us an opportunity to practice modeling things that are that are more rigid and a little bit more uh, soft and uh, more organic. Okay, so a good approach here would be to build each part separately. We'll kind of put it together. It'll kind of feel like we're putting together IKEA furniture. So to get started on this chair, we're gonna build all these wooden parts with cubes. So let's just go to our polygons tab and we'll go to the cube and we'll just click on that just to create a cube. All right, so we're gonna create the front right leg first. Activate your scale tool by hitting R on the keyboard. We're just gonna scale it to its approximate height, width, and depth. All right, so you notice when I'm scaling it, if I scale the height, it increases the height from the top and bottom. 
I may want to adjust the height later and I don't want to have to keep scaling it and moving it up. It's because the pivot points in the center that it's scaling it outward from both directions. I want the pivot point to be at the bottom. You can hit insert. If you're using a laptop, you may need to hold function down and press insert and you should get something like this. And now you can move the pivot point down to the bottom. Now you want to be, I'd like to have it exactly at the bottom. I don't want to have it slightly below or slightly under. If you hit V on your keyboard, it'll activate this tool up here. It'll snap to the object. If we hit insert again, now our pivot points locked in. So now if I try to scale it, it'll only scale it from the bottom up. Let's just place that right down on the grid. All right, so let's go back over to our channel box under inputs. We have this poly cube and we can control the amount of subdivisions that we need by selecting the, the name of the attribute and just middle mouse button and dragging anywhere in the viewport here. Because this object doesn't need to bend, it's just a chair leg. It's not gonna flex or bend at all. We don't really need a lot of subdivisions on it. If it was a chair that would have to start walking, you would wanna put more of these subdivisions in so that the legs can flex and bend later on. I'm thinking that this chair is just gonna be a prop. So we don't need any subdivisions at all. You notice the bottom of the leg is very narrow and the top is a little wider. So I'm just gonna narrow this whole thing out a little bit just so that the, I get the bottom the way I like it. And then we're gonna widen the top. All right, so we'll right click on it. Let's select face, select the face and we can just scale it. Now you can also, if you right click again, you can go to vertex. You can select the vertexes and scale it that way as well. It does the same thing. All right, so once you're happy with it, you can go back to object mode by hitting F8. And let's go to our modeling toolkit. We're just gonna bevel this now. So I already have my modeling toolkit open on the side on a tab. If you don't, then you can just hit this button here on the left and it'll bring you your modeling toolkit. All right, so I need to uh, bevel this. So I'm gonna go down to under my components and I click on the bevel button and it'll automatically bevel it. But then we get these options that come up in this little window here. And you can see that we have fraction and segments, those two important ones. So you can actually hover over the name fraction and just drag. So I think something around 0.5 three or four would be good. We only want it beveled just a little bit. And you can see in the image here, the posts are beveled a little bit. And it's because these pieces of wood are, they've been manufactured. So we just want to give it a look like it's been manufactured a little bit. Just it gives it a more natural look just so it's not so, so rigid. And then we'll change the segments just to round it off a little bit to about four should be good. And that looks good. So now it looks, that post looks like it's been machined and sanded down. Now that it's been beveled, if you try to change the subdivisions, it gets all bungled up. So you, that's why you really wanna make sure you do the subdivisions first. You can still change the depth, height, and width. So you can still scale it. We need two of these legs, so we're just gonna hold control down and press D. You can also go to edit under duplicate and just click on duplicate. And you can see the short key for that is control D. So we'll just click on that once. It just duplicated it over top of the old one. So I'll hit W on my keyboard to move it over. All right, so let's make that center post now. I'm just gonna hit my cube and just roughly adjust the shape using the scale tool. And it's perfectly fine if they go into each other, it's not a problem. So something like that should be good and we'll bevel that. Go back to our modeling toolkit, hit bevel. So I can type that right in since I already know I like it at 0.4 and the segments are four. All right, now what we should do is group these together. So let's open up our hypergraph. Go to Windows under Hypergraph. Now the hypergraph really just gives us these nodes that represent our objects. So if we click on them, it'll actually select the objects we have in the scene. So if I select this one, it selects our plane, our polyplane. And we can rename these. I'll just name this reference. It's good to rename them so you know what they are later on. And this one's our our front right leg. We can right click and choose rename here, or if you have your channel box open and you have the object selected, you can see the name up here. You can just click on that and rename it there as well. I'm gonna name it front right leg. And if I click on polycube two, that's our front left leg. And this is the front crossbar. All right, so now we have them all named. And what I could do is just select all these. You can drag a box over all three of these, these objects in the hypergraph. And then you can hold control down and press G. And that'll actually group them all together. You can see now they're all underneath one new node. Now this node doesn't have an object, but it's, it's just a group node that it selects all three of these objects. And you can see all three of them have been linked to this group node. So let's name that. Let's just rename that to front legs. We can select each one individually. 
and you can see that it's selecting them in the hypergraph as well. And if you hit your up arrow on the keyboard, it'll just go straight to the front legs group that we created. So no matter what you're doing in the viewport, if you have any one of these selected, you can hit your up arrow and go right to the top of the hierarchy and just move the whole thing. Now you can see the pivot point when I go to activate my move tool or a rotate tool. It's rotating it from, from the first leg that we created. So you can actually center the pivot point if you want that to be in the middle. You can go do that by going to Modify, Center Pivot, and it'll center the pivot of the group and just put it right in the middle. If you want to change the pivot point and put it down to the bottom, you can do that as well so that it pivots from the bottom. You can do it the same way that we did the first leg. I can give it a tilt. All right, so I'm just going to close up this hypergraph. Let's change our interface a little bit so that it's easier to work. Let's do uh, two panels side by side. As you learned from the last class, there's these interface presets. So let's do a side by side panel layout. That way I can work in this perspective view and I can have my hypergraph up on this view. So let's go to panels, hypergraph panel, and we'll choose hypergraph. So now we can have our hypergraph here. We can see all of our nodes. I can continue to create new cubes for all these pieces of the chair, but I already have one that's similar to this crossbar that I need. So I'm just going to duplicate that. We'll just hit control D on our keyboard and let's move it up. And the more narrow end is on the front. So I'm just going to rotate that. And it's real handy that we have the pivot point at the bottom here, because now I can just scale this straight out. And you can see that it's kind of angled here, so we can we can make adjustments to that as well. Let's go to our vertex. Because we beveled it, we have a whole bunch of vertexes here on the corners. But you can just select all of those. Use your rotate tool and just rotate that a little bit. This one's going to need to be rotated as well. You can see it's it's going to connect to this other post. Rough that in for now. We might have to change it later. So we can go back to object mode and see it's handy to hit F8 just to quickly get to your object mode. I'll just bring that forward and just sort of eyeball it. Okay, so I'm just going to duplicate that. Control D, let's slide it over. Reuse this one. Control D, let's move it over. So this is for the back legs. So instead of scaling this one, if I scale it too much, the beveling also scales. It gets scaled a little too much and then it's the beveling's uneven, so it's probably better just to right click, select the vertexes, and we can move them straight up. That way the beveling stays intact. All right, so at this point, I think I'm going to create this post here just to make sure that it hooks up best with this one. We can make the adjustments to both and then we'll just duplicate them to the other side. So I think I will for this one create a new cube. I can see this one's fastened to the inside of this post, so I'll just stick it on the inside a little bit. Back to our modeling toolkit, bevel. And I remember this being 0.4. And just keep making adjustments as you need to, just to get it to fit together properly. If you're actually designing furniture with this, you'd want it to be to spec and everything to be measured properly. But if you're just using this for an animated short, for a TV show or film, everything doesn't need to be measured perfectly to spec. It, it just has to look good. That's what we're doing here. So I notice that I'm just going to make some tweaks to the bottom of the legs just to get them to look like they're flat on the ground, just so they're not angled like that. And we can just select the vertexes on the one side. Sometimes it's handy to hit four on your keyboard to go to wire mesh. And we can do both at the same time, actually. You just hold shift down to select all of these. If you want to get more precise, if you go to panels, orthographic, we'll go to front and we can just zoom right in and make sure that they're flat on the ground. And you can do the same thing with the other side. So actually if you hit spacebar and right mouse button click, it'll give you right bottom, back top and left views and perspective view. We can go right back to perspective. So that's spacebar and right click. Press 5 to get back to shaded mode and press F8 to get back to object mode. I'm just going to hit 6 on the keyboard to see our reference again. So we have this new cube that we created. These other ones that we duplicated just went right into our hierarchy. So if we select the top, it gets everything but this new cube we created. I'm going to duplicate these together. So if we shift select both of those and hit control D, then we'll move them over together. 
now we can rename these two cubes and we can add them to the group. So we'll name this uh, right back post. Rename this one left back post. And actually these ones be duplicated so we can rename those as well. Back right leg. And we'll change the name of this one. Just put a B instead of an F. There, so we have our whole frame completed. And if we select any one of these posts and hit the up arrow on our keyboard, it'll select the whole frame. Now we don't have those two back nodes included in the, in the group. So if you just select one and middle mouse button, drag it over to the top node, it will place it underneath the entire hierarchy. There, so we can select it from here and get the whole thing. Or you can just select any one of these posts and hit the up arrow and it'll bring you right to the top of that hierarchy. Now I noticed while I was building this chair, I kept accidentally selecting the reference and it's really I'm selecting the polygon plane. So what you could do is put that on a layer. So if you have it selected and you hit this little button here, it's create new layer with assigned selection. So if you click on that, it'll automatically give you this new layer. Clicking the V on and off toggles the, the visibility on the object. And then on the far right, if you click it to T, that just stands for template and you don't see the polygon anymore. But if you click it again and turn the R on, that stands for reference and that just allows you to see it, but you can't click on it. You can't click on that, but you can click on other objects. Let's model the cushions. Now, I think what I'm gonna do is just model the big cushion first and then I can duplicate it for the other cushion. All right, so of course, again, we're gonna start off with a cube. Most things that you model in Maya are gonna start with a cube. I'm just gonna bring it over to the frame and just get the approximate size. All right, so now we're gonna use some of the tools and functions that we looked over a few minutes ago. So we'll just bring that out here. We're gonna change our smooth level. So remember one, two, and three are the different levels. So we'll go to, right now we're on one. With the cushion selected, we're gonna to go to two. Just press two on your keyboard. And now it gives us a preview of what it might look like once it's smoothed. If you're getting this kind of situation happening where it's not rotating in the center, you can hit F on your keyboard to center it. That's to focus in on the object. And now we can just rotate around it no problem. So we're gonna use the insert loop tool to add some edges to this, some edge loops. So let's go to our modeling menu set. Now the insert loop tool, if we go to our modeling toolkit, it's not here. They didn't put a button in for that. I hope they do sometime in the future, in future releases of Maya, but it isn't there. So we'll just go to mesh tools and just go to insert edge loop tool. We'll click on that. All right, and then it automatically goes to component mode. And we're just gonna be working with the outer mesh, the low poly cage. The low poly cage gives you the actual shape of, of what the polygon is, of what our cube is. If we hit one, we can see it. And two, basically we can see through it and see the preview of what it's gonna look like smooth at about two, right? So now that we have our insert edge loop tool activated, we can click anywhere on these edges and before you release, you can drag to see where you want to put it. Now I'm going to put this right near the end here, right about there. And as soon as you release, you can see it changes the shape of the, the preview. So you can see here, we already kind of have close, something close to what we're looking for. Now we're going to need a few edge loops. So I'm going to put another one in and I'll just work with the front for now. Then I'll do the same thing on the back later. So let's see what we can get by moving the edges around. So we'll right click over it and we'll go to edge. So W on the keyboard for your move tool, and we'll start moving these down. Now we can move these down, these edges down individually, or you can select the top and bottom. You can hit R on your keyboard for the scale tool. So with those two edges shift selected, and you can just scale them this way. So we already have the insert edge loop tool sitting in our toolbar here. So we can just click that again over here, or you can hit G on your keyboard to activate the last tool that was used. Insert another one here right in the middle, just to flesh it out a little bit more. Let's do the same thing to the other side. I can see it's not really the same on both sides. They made this one a little bit tighter. So hit four on the keyboard to see through it. And let's go to our vertexes. Okay, so I'm just looking at this and it's a little bit too tapered on the right and left side. So I think I need to insert another edge right here. So I hit our insert edge loop tool again. I'll insert another edge loop just close to the sides. Something like that. The further you go closer to the edge, the sharper it'll be. So I already have this whole edge loop selected. 
you see what I mean if I go closer to the edge you can see how it gets a little pointier if you go really close it'll be a hard edge so we want to move it further away just so it's a nice rounded corner it's not too sharp so let's place it back in there all right so I'm just gonna scale the whole thing let's just get it closer to the shape that it's supposed to be all right, so let's go back to two and we got our low poly cage here. I'm gonna insert another edge loop, insert one in the middle. And it's already selected. So I'm just gonna give it a bit of a, a push down just so it looks like it's been sat on at least. You can keep shaving this until you're happy with it. Now if you want to add some more fine detail, if you really want to get the this trim on it, it's a little bit more work obviously. It can easily be done with a texture, but if you want to have that modeled in, we can have a real thin cylinder and just bend it around. It'll add a lot of polygons. I can quickly go over and show you how to model that in. Select a polygon cylinder up here in our polygon shelf. We don't need a lot of subdivisions on the cap, so let's just go to our channel box and we'll go to the caps and we'll just keep the caps at zero and let's just change the radius we'll make it really thin and we can actually scale it down a little bit so let's bring it up into place I don't want to move the cushion so let's just hide this whole frame just by selecting it and hitting control H on our keyboard you can see that it grays out the the top node there if you want it back you just select it and hit shift H so again, we'll just hit Control H just to hide it for now, just so we can have space to do this trim. And the way I would handle this is to do an extrusion. So we'll just place it in the corner here. I'm gonna get the radius down a little bit more. Let's go to like 0 0.05. And then what we wanna do is we wanna switch to component mode. So we'll right click on it and select face. And we're just gonna select the end here. And we're gonna start doing some extrusions. We can go to our modeling toolkit turn on extrude and we can literally start extruding this all the way around the chair you see how it's sunken in here about halfway I'm just gonna make sure I keep it in there like that and you can just keep hitting G on the keyboard to activate the extrusion again if you need to extrude it further let's just move this out of the way for now All right, so at this point I might want to start rotating it so it follows the edge of the cushion. So we can hit this outer circle. If we just click on it once, we'll get the rotation manipulators. I can start rotating that polygon. And then we can hit G again. But if this happens and you have this, this really sharp angle, we can go back and adjust that later. We can even insert an edge loop here later on just to fix it. All right, so I'll just get these butt up together. It doesn't have to be perfect, but just get, get them close. And it's actually a good idea to have the seam somewhere where it's maybe behind the, the post so it's hidden. And then you can see that I didn't get it perfectly lined up here. So we can go through now, after you've done going all the way around, make adjustments just by going to wireframe. And just sort of fix it up a little bit. We'll hit F8 to get out of component mode, and we'll just have a quick look at it. And that looks okay. I mean, again, I would go through and uh, finesse that a little bit more. I just did that rather quickly for demonstration purposes, but it actually isn't too bad. Okay, so I'm gonna call that the right seat trim. And I'll drag that onto the, the cushion. We'll rename that cushion to, we'll just name it seat cushion. All right, so now we have those linked together. All right, so let's turn our legs back on. Let's hit shift H. Now creating the seat cushion in the trim, it's quite a bit of work. What I would do is just copy this, let's just make a duplicate of it. So we'll control D, we'll duplicate that and we'll bring it up. And let's just use it for the back cushion as well. Scale it into shape.
All right, so let's get the trim on the other side. I'm just going to hide my reference here just so I don't run into it. Now, because it was quite a bit of work, I'm not going to go through and do all that again, but we can we can just duplicate it. Let's bring it to the other side. It probably won't match perfectly. We can make adjustments to it so it fits. So let's just turn the legs off again, control H. A great way to do this would be to use our soft selections. Let's go in the middle here where it's sinking into the pillow. Let's go to our modeling toolkit and turn on soft selection. Okay, so you can see the hotspot is is pretty widespread. We can bring this number down to say three. So right now it's at five. So let's bring it down to three. And you can see our hotspot changes. We're gonna have to bring it down quite a bit. Let's say one. And this is where soft selections come in really, really handy. And you can continuously bring this down. I'm gonna bring it down to 0.5. Say I wanna get this corner in here. It's always good to hit four on your keyboard just to see the wireframe so you don't accidentally select things behind it. So let's copy this. And we'll just do the same thing with this one and then our chair will be complete. So go back to Vertex. Yeah, and that's looking pretty good. Okay, let's go back to object mode. Turn our chair legs back on. So shift H. So you can see where the beveling, extruding, and insert edge loop tool come in really handy when modeling rigid objects and organic objects. So now let's model a coffee cup and I'll demonstrate some more modeling functions that'll come in handy later on. All right, so let's build a coffee cup. We're gonna be covering a couple of different mesh editing functions and tools. So let's go to our polygons shelf and we'll just click on our cylinder just to get the basic shape of our coffee cup. I'm just going to scale this up a little bit. Set it down on the mesh. We'll hit two to get our outer cage. That way we can see the low poly and we can see the, what the smoothed uh, object is going to look like. So we'll always work this way when we're modeling. So the first thing we want to do is get the right amount of uh, edges in. We want to get the, the mesh the way we need it before we begin. So let's go to our channel box and you can see here when we created the cylinder it gave us this the inputs. Under inputs, it gave us a poly cylinder one. Of course, we can rename that later, but if we click on it, we have the radius and height and the subdivisions. We want to give ourselves at least one subdivision for the cap so that we can extrude the cup and hollow it out later. Increase the subdivision caps to two. For the handles, we're going to need a couple of edge loops in here on the side, but we'll do that with the insert edge loop tool. So let's go to mesh tools and go to insert edge loop tool. And I'm just going to put in two at the top and two at the bottom. We don't want our coffee cup to be this thick. We're gonna take the inner loop and we're just gonna scale it up a little bit. So let's right click and go to vertex. I'm just gonna hit four on my keyboard so I can see through the mesh. We'll use the lasso tool for this and we'll just lasso right around all these vertexes. It's gonna select some of the ones behind it. But we'll just use the lasso tool to deselect those. So if you hold shift down, you can deselect them. That way we just have these the vertices for the edge loop and you can see I missed one here. You wanna make sure you get every single one. I'm going to hit five on the keyboard just so I can see the shading and R to scale. Let's scale that up. I'm just going to bring it right to about there. What we're going to do next is select all the faces on the inside of this cap and we're going to extrude them down just to hollow out our cup. Actually, before I do that, let's make this cup a little bit taller so we can get more room for the, for the handle. So let's right click. We'll select faces. So just select the first one and we'll hold shift down, go all the way around the cup to select all of them. And let's go to our modeling toolkit. So let's hit extrude. And right away you can see we have our multi-tool here. We have a translation option. If we click on any one of these tool options, we can scale and we can also rotate. But we'll get into that in a few minutes when we do the, the handle. Right now we're just going to do a straight extrusion downward. So if I go all the way down with it, you can see what happens to the rim of the, the mug. It gets kind of sharp. So I'm just going to go down a little bit and then we'll extrude again. And we'll continue. Let's hit spacebar and we can see all the orthographic views. Over here we have our side view. If I hit four, we can see the wire mesh in the side view. I just want to do that so I can see how far down I'm bringing it. And that's fine. If you don't want the bottom to be so rounded, you can just do another extrusion. 
All right, so that's fine. I'm gonna hit spacebar again to go full screen in my perspective view. Let's move this out of the way. All right, so now we need to work on the handle. So when we create the handle, I'm actually gonna extrude one of these faces. I wanna make sure that I'm extruding even with the world's orientation. So I wanna go straight out in the X axis. I don't wanna extrude out on an angle here. So I'm just gonna rotate my whole object. So let's go to the top view for a minute. this face here pointing straight out in the x-axis. So I'll right click and choose face. So I'll go to my modeling toolkit and let's go to components and extrude. So let's just translate it out. Still about that much and we'll use the outer ring here. If we click on that it'll give us our rotation manipulators. I want to angle it down a little bit. That's going to determine uh, the direction that our next extrusion is going to go. So let's hit extrude again, and right away it gives us another face that's stuck to the old one. We'll pull it away. I'm gonna bring it down. And we'll hit that outer ring. Let's rotate it a little bit. And just keep rotating it and translating it so that it's going in the direction that you'd like it to. It's always good to zoom out and rotate around it and look at it, see how it's coming along as you're forming your object. Hit five again to check that, and that looks pretty good. Let's create the bottom of the mug. So right click and let's choose face. We're gonna select that face there, and we'll hit extrude. And again, we're gonna do the same thing. Let's pull it away. And we don't have to have this match up perfectly, but I use I like to get it as close as I can. Now we need to connect these together. So if I right click and go to vertice, we're gonna merge this vertice with this one, this one with this one, and go all the way around and just snap these together. Now one thing I wanna mention before we even do that is I'm just gonna right click and go to face for a minute. You can see that we have, obviously we have faces all over this polygon object, but remember there's a face here as well, and there's a face on the inside here as well. We're gonna to have to go back, after we merge these vertices together, we're gonna to have to go back and delete these faces it's much more difficult to do after you've merged the vertices together. So a good thing to do is actually to delete them now. I'm going to delete them while both sides of the handle are still apart from each other. Just simply select the face and hit delete on the keyboard. And you can see it opens up. We'll select the face on the inside of this one and delete it as well. Just select it and hit delete. And now we'll merge the vertices together. You can do it after you've merged the vertices together, but it's just, it's more of a pain. So let's we'll right click, go to vertices. And we'll go over to our target wheel tool. If you click on that, just go to one vertice, click, and you'll see this orange circle appear around it. And then just drag down to the second vertice that you want to merge it with. And you'll see a, this orange line appear and release. And it snaps right together. So we'll do the same thing with this one. Click, drag over, release. And we'll do it with all four. And now it's snapped together nicely and now it's all one piece. So that's basically how you build a mug. Now you can go through and just sort of reshape the uh, the handle. I can see this handle is very thin, which is probably fine, but just for aesthetics, you can go through and just reshape it. So we'll just go back to one and select the object. Once you're completely happy with how it looks, We'll go to the last step here and just select the object. We'll go to Mesh. Let's go to the Smooth option box. And we can see we have the subdivision level set to three. I'm gonna put it on two, we'll hit Apply. And then now it's actually smoothed. If I hit Control Z on my keyboard, we can actually undo that. Let's go to a division level of one, just to experiment. You can see what that looks like and just click off to see it. Now that's not really smooth enough. It doesn't look very good. It's very faceted, chunky looking. It doesn't look very good. So we'll undo that, Control Z. Usually a subdivision level of two is good. Now if I undo that again, let's go to three, and we'll apply that. Now that's a lot of mesh for a prop. It'll bogging down our scene if we model all of our props like that, and it's just not necessary to have your, your mesh that tight, especially for a prop that's not gonna bend and flex. So I'll just Control Z to get out of that. A division level of two is, is good. You want it to look smooth enough with the least amount of faces. 
Once you've completed your model and you've you've smoothed it, you can add some stylization to it by using the deformers in Maya. Make sure you're under the modeling menu set, and if you go to deform under nonlinear, we have these nonlinear deformers. So we have bend, flare, sine, squash, twist, and wave. Let's just look at the bend deformer first. So I already have my mug selected. Click on that, and you'll see this line here. To see the deformer, make sure that under show, you have deformers checked. Right now I have everything checked. So once it's applied in your channel box here under inputs, you can see bend one is now here. You have a few attributes under bend. Let's just look at curvature for a minute. If we select that attribute and use our virtual slider, middle mouse button, drag, you'll see we can bend the cup. Now we wouldn't want it to be bent this way, I don't think. You'd want it to probably bend from the bottom up. Let's take a look at low bound and high bound. Now I'm just gonna go into wireframe for a minute so we can see the deformer and the object at the same time. You can see low bound by default is set to minus one and high bound is one. If we zoom in on the deformer here for a minute, you can see there's a little line here. That's the center of the deformer. So if we set low bound to zero, you can see it deforms from the bottom up and that's really where I want it for the cup here. But if I just undo that and set high bound to zero, it does the opposite thing. It, it bends from the, from the center down. In this case, I want it to bend from the bottom up. So I'm gonna set low bound to zero and then you can actually translate and rotate and scale these deformers around. So I'm just going to move it down to the bottom of the cup. And we can go in our orthographic view, use Shift A to center everything. Make sure my deformer is at the bottom here. And then you can scale this up. So let's just scale it up. I'm going to use the, the center scale option just so it scales all dimensions at the same time. I'm going to hit 5 to go back to shaded mode. So now we have the deformer bending it from the bottom up. Go to my curvature attribute again and middle mouse button drag. Now right now it's just bending it in the X dimension, but you can actually rotate the deformer any way you need to. And you can see it just pivots around. This is a way that you can stylize your props and that's just using the bend deformer. And then you can add other deformers. You can move them, rotate them, and scale them as you wish. So let's go back to the deformers. Actually, you have to have your object selected first. Let's go to deform, nonlinear, and let's look at the flare deformer. Under inputs, it puts a flare deformer. So we have start flare X and Z, and then we have end flare X and Z. Let's look at the first one. So start flare X, this that basically affects the bottom. So we have X and we have Z. Scales it in both directions. And then end flare is the top. Scales it in both directions. And then curve actually will give us a bulge in the middle. So that's a nice way to stylize your prop. So say I want it to be a little bit thicker at the top, I'll just use the end flares. I can highlight both those attributes at the same time if I want to get it even. And then you can just keep messing around with it that way until you get the, the stylization that you want. So it gives it a cartoony look and it totally depends on the style that you're going for. All right, so we'll just select that cup again and we'll take a look at another nonlinear deformer. We have the squash, of course. Again, we get another input here, factor is the amount of squash that we get. It's the same uh, situation as the bend where there's a center, which is this big ring right around the, the middle. Then we have a high bound and low bound. So, okay, so if we set the low bound to zero, and then we go to factor, you can see it squashes from the bottom up. Now if we set the high bound to zero, it'll squash from the top down. But this is generally what we would want for this, for this cup. And we want to do the same thing as we did with the bend, just bring it down to the bottom and we can scale it up so that it affects the entire thing. We just want that crosshair at the top to be over the model. So now if we virtual slide our factor attribute, we can squash it up and down. Then we have twist. Look at the inputs. So under start angle, start angle is the bottom. We can twist it this way. End angle is the top. It twists it the other way. Envelope is the amount. And then we have a high bound and low bound for that one as well. So once you get it styled the way you'd like it, normally what I would do is uh, just duplicate it and then all these deformations that you've applied will, will be frozen to the duplicate. So I could just control D or you can go to edit duplicate and then I would just move the prop over. This is our duplicate. Now it's frozen like that. This cup, it has these deformers applied to it, but the deformers aren't really going to go with it unless you either constrain or group them to the cup. You could always just select all of it and hide it. Control H on your keyboard just to hide it. And then that way it'll always be there. It won't render if it's hidden. And you still have your old one there if you wanna modify it and reduplicate it. And you can do this with the chair or any other props. It's just a great way to stylize your props for any kind of production.
All right, so when we get into modeling a character's head and body, we'll be looking at more of the functions and modeling tools. Before we finish off, I just wanted to take a look at the, the sculpting tools in Maya. Let's go to the polygon shelf and I'll just create a plane. I'm just gonna scale it up and let's bring it up above the mesh. All right, so I'm gonna increase the mesh. So I'll go to the subdivisions uh, width and height. I'm just gonna select both those attributes and middle mouse button virtual slide and drag to increase the mesh. We'll just go all the way with it. So let's go to the sculpting shelf. I'm gonna select the first one. This is to lift surfaces. So we'll just execute that. All right, so right up at the top right hand corner of the interface, there's this button here. It's for the show and hide tool settings. I'm gonna click on that. So let's take a look at the tool settings. Under brush, we have size, size units. We can just leave that on world and then strength. Size and strength are the two that you're gonna slide back and forth when you're using the sculpt tool. If I just left mouse button click over this mesh, you can see that it, it pulls the, the mesh up a little bit. So if I increase the strength, you'll see that it does it a lot more. And somewhere in the middle of that, so we'll increase our brush size. So this is a great way to build terrain if you're building a, a scene file and your environment just has a, any kind of a outdoor terrain. This is a great way to, to build it. It also it comes in handy when you're finessing areas on a character's head, like the ears and stuff like that. You can use the smooth options. This is the smooth tool. So let's execute that. And again, we have size and strength. Strength comes in really handy when you're smoothing because sometimes you don't want to smooth it that much. So say we did something like this and you, see, you can see that it's kind of jagged. So now I have the smooth selected. You can see that it just sort of tones it down. It just smoothens it out. Oftentimes when you're using these tools, or especially with smooth, you'll you'll be constantly moving the, the strength up and down. So say you don't want it to be uh, this exaggerated. You can crank the strength up quite a bit and it'll it'll really smooth it out a lot. Or if you do like it like that and you just want to tone it down a tiny bit, you can drag the smoothing down to a lower amount and it'll just smooth it a little bit. All right, so the next is the relax tool. It's very similar to what the smooth does. It just sort of relaxes the mesh. I'm just gonna hit four on my keyboard so we can see the mesh a little bit better. And it really just relaxes the mesh. It, it averages the vertices and spreads them out a little bit. All right, so let's go to the next one. It's the grab tool. So I'll execute that. Again, you have the size and strength. You can also check this button for, if you wanna twist the mesh. But what it does generally is just grabs a, a section of mesh inside the brush. And if you click and hold down, you can see it just grabs it and, and pulls it. That can come in handy if you want to specify little areas on the terrain that you want to adjust or on the character. And again, you can always go back and smooth these out. Just to tone it down a little bit. All right, so the next is the pinch tool. So again, it's hard to see without going into wireframe, but I'll go into wireframe so you can see what it does. And if I just drag along the mesh, you can see it just pinches the mesh together a little bit. And that comes in handy in certain situations. There's the flatten tool. It really just, it's very similar to the smooth tool. The smooth and relax and flatten tool are all just very similar. They do similar things. But really that just flattens those areas. The foamy tool and the spray tool are also very similar. Let's go to the spray tool. This gives you like a sort of a scattered effect, almost like a spray can. You can see it sort of gives you multiple bumps and then you can smooth that out as well. The repeat tool just does the same thing. It repeats the last thing you did. The stamp tool, you can import an image in here and you can sculpt with the image that you bring in. So I encourage you to experiment with some of these other tools. Some of them are kind of redundant. I find that they're kind of redundant and similar to one another. Some of them just, I don't find that they're all that useful. One cool thing they added is this freeze point tool. So if you select that and you brush over a certain area, you'll see it paints it blue. It won't actually render blue, but it, what it does is it, the area that's painted can no longer be uh, affected. So say you have an area that you've sculpted and you like the way it's looking, you can paint it to freeze the mesh and then that way you won't be able to affect it anymore. So if I go back to the, the sculpt tool, you can see that I'm still sculpting this area, but when you drag over the blue area, it's frozen. It won't sculpt that area. So it just holds it for you. All right, so that's it for the sculpt tool. It's something that you have to really experiment with and just get the hang of it, but do experiment because next we'll be modeling a character's head and when we get to the refining stage, we'll probably use the sculpt tool just to refine certain areas of the character.